Unmatched, The Mitchells vs. The Machines, and Forks in the Timeline. This is Staying In. I played golf the other day. I went Did and you? Golf. Yeah. Real yeah, golf? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, this is real golf <laughs> with clubs and everything and balls. Yeah. yeah. Good. And it was on a, it's basically this farmer has uh, portioned <laughs> off a section of land <laughs> and made a nine hole golf course with like, when there's nobody there, there's an honesty box. But yeah, it's a nine hole golf course. It's really relaxed. There's not like a dress code or anything like that per se. So there were people there who were just in like their joggers with cans of wicked strength cider just walking around. So, so, so <laughs> what, what are the hazards like? Are we, uh, is it like, you know, just like a patch of cabbages? No. <laughs> a cow. Right, there, yeah, there, there was there were sandpits, people, but I've never had this before because usually a sandpit is like something you tend to avoid because the ball just lands in it. I think, I think it's it. called a bunker. Yeah, a bunker. That's it. Yeah, thanks, Dan. A sandpit is a very different thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just one giant cat litter tray just next to the green, but the ball just shot straight out the other end. It just didn't stop in it. There was one hole which you had you teed off literally right next to a road, and the hole was on the other side of the road, so you had to look for traffic coming before you took your shot. What? Yeah, it was right next to it. And also there was a tree in front of you as well. Um, they've, they've literally tried to compress nine holes into a very small space. So three of the holes actually play across each other, crisscross over each other. That's so dangerous. <laughs> uh, absolutely extraordinary. But one thing I noticed while playing was that I was saying, like, you know, golf things. Like, oh, it's in the rough. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking I, I, I haven't played golf in years where's this all coming from and I realised I was I was channel channeling Microsoft Golf 2 yeah. where every time you took a shot somebody would throw in a bit of a quip oh you're dancing it's on the yeah, green yeah perfect <laughs> it's in the rough <laughs> or, or the, the there was a there was a uh, there was the the compact range of PCs would come with video games that you would have and uh the one that we got was PGA Tour ninety five, and it and it had like photorealistic graphics, by which they mean they videoed someone and then they played that the animation of somebody swinging a club, and then you saw the sort of ball fly out. Oh, it was amazing, and you would get that commentary of like, of like talking about like I you know talking about like is it s like sawgrass the the yeah. the. the they're like they'd be talking mm -hmm. about like sawgrass and stuff like that and like you know there's like 12 year old me like wow sawgrass that sounds like a great place and it's obviously like this like high-end golf club in america or something like that and you but you'd know you'd know what it was about see i think i my kind of uh kind of discovery of all those terms through was also through a video game but like when i was young like my mom and dad would take me and my sister and we'd go to the, we'd go down to kind of the local pub quite often it was like a social thing where they'd meet their friends and stuff like that and in the pub there was always like a big video game cabinet and like there was a time there was like a pj tour game or there might be like daytona usa was there and like the the amount of excitement you would get when you walked in and there was a new like yeah. new cabinet and you're like oh and then eventually they changed it to like a a fruit machine you're like oh no this is like yeah. this is even as a child like this isn't fun i don't even if yeah. disregarding the fact that i was too young to play i was like that doesn't look fun i want to play the video games when i look at fruit machines right in a, in a pub or something like that i see all the flashing lights and immediately i'm attracted because like <laughs> because you're a lights uh, yeah basically it's loud it's like got flashing lights everywhere things spin there's cherries i love it looks great I've never quite understood. Like, I get one-armed bandits. Perfectly fine. That's fine. I can do digital poker. That's no problem. But whenever I see things like a fruity, I'm always thinking to myself, how does anybody actually learn how to play this and then get good at it? I mean, first things first, I think we should all take Pete to the fair because yeah. that will blow his mind. Mm -hmm. It's through trial and error because generally with those machines, it fla the buttons that you can press are the ones that are flashing. So it's not like you've got all these opportunities and choices and things. It's just about um, the way I started with them. I started as if like <laughs> the I'm way a professional. I started, how I how I got my in, <laughs> yeah. How I broke into the uh, the uh, the whole uh, practice of it was pressing the buttons that were flashing and not pressing the ones that weren't. Yeah, but some of the most of the time, half of the buttons are broken. Or at least well, yeah, the lights well, I, are. I used to. I worked in a pub, and we had like a fruit machine next to it. And the lady I used to work with behind the bar, she would just sit there watching everyone sink money into this thing, 
mm-hmm. and then just sashay over, kind of like cracker knuckles, and then just empty it. So you can't get good at them? You just can't, like... I think you can get good at them. Yeah. But part of getting good at them is knowing when they're gonna when they're gonna pay out when they're gonna get right. a, when you're gonna get the payday because I remember when I used to play um, uh, lots of when we were allowed to go out and touch things mm-hmm. um, I remember I used to play a lot of quiz machines uh, down the old pub mm-hmm. and um, one of the uh, great things about that is most of the quiz machines would give you a very early indication on whether they were playing to pay out or they're not <laughs> going to pay out at all so it would be like the first question would be like either something like what color is a cloud it'd be like white purple or black and then that would be like right i think we've got i think we've got a, i think we've got a loose one here lads <laughs> uh, or like the first question would be in the Battle of Agincourt at 323, <laughs> how many bullets were fired by the arrow gun? And and um, then you'd just be like, oh, no, this is a lost this is a lost cause. We're just not going to win anything here. Just walk away. Don't um, bother using the lifeline. That, that was part of that, was part <laughs> of that skill, that learning, was kind of like knowing... We need to carry on sinking money into this because <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna pay out soon and big time. Um, I mean, do you know what that reminds me of? Like when I was a kid, I used to go to the arcades, and my parents used to we used to stay in a caravan, a seaside caravan in Wales, and there was an arcade there, and they had these kind of old school kind of analog machines where you'd, you'd you'd drop a two p into it, and what you'd have on one of them, and it was hypnotic, was this. This metallic shelf that moved back and forth, and it had like a big pile oh, yeah, of two peas yeah. on it. Penny yeah. push. And you're just hoping you're just hoping that your two p would be the one that would cause the avalanche of yeah. two peas to fall in there. And you're just watching this thing going back and forth. <laughs> and you, clearly, it's been super glued down. There was a Pac-Man one that was amazing uh, of those, where you could see it, you could like flick it up into the system. It'd be amazing. But do you know what? For me, I'm old school. I don't need to bet on things. For me. All I need is one of those things. You remember you used to put two peas in for charity and you'd watch it spin around in this vortex. You'd, yeah. you'd watch the coin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you, you do not see much of those these days no, you at don't, all. Do you? They're great. That's all I needed. <laughs> that'd, be right. in, that'd, be in, that'd be in your perfect arcade, wouldn't it? Would you, would you all like to play a game? Yes. Would you like Always. to play a game? Would you like to play a game? Um, yes. Good. Is it, a, is it a real game or is it something that Sam has just thought up in his head? <laughs> it is. Um, I can I can just hang on. Yeah, it, it ah, exists. It's an external it's, game. It's good, it's good foley. Um, Chris originally messaged me about this game and he said something like, next time we're travelling, we're bringing this. So I um, I reached out to the company who made it, made it who were Kepler Games. And they were they were very happy to send us a copy to play mm. on the uh, on the show. Oh, fantastic! So I thought this isn't a game that you just talk about. This is a game that you play. Okay. And it's called Forks in the Timeline. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen is that um, I'm going to give you an alternate timeline. So is there something about this this timeline, this history that we're living in, which is different to the one that we're living in now? And then I'm going to pose a question. And, I mean, this game has shares a lot of sort of DNA with things like um, Bucket of Doom, Super Fight, um, to a lesser degree, Cards Against Humanity. You know, there's games that are really there to encourage, like, conversation and play and imagination and, you know, um, sort of loosening up of the social environment, shall right. I say. Yep, okay. Um, but I think, personally, I think unlike games like especially Cards Against Humanity um, and unlike Super Fight and Bucket of Doom, I think that Forks in the Timeline has one of those rare qualities that every time I've played it, it's always done a superb job of keeping that conversation going. So this is how it works. Um, it comes in this really nice box. It's just separated into three different sections. A bonus fork and question. The bonus stuff is 
um, uh, has to do with some of the ways that they've gamified it, which is fine, which is fine. But every time I've played it, I've just kind of just like, uh, we've had a couple of nice pizza evenings outside. I was kind of like left it on the table and just said, you know, pick it up, pick a few things and play it with. Me and Chris went on a very nice walk recently and I like picked up a couple of these cards and just took it with us. And like we had a, oh my God, some of the chats that we were having, it was great. Anyway, it was amazing. We we actually got delayed because ironically, we went the wrong direction down a fork in the path because we were playing this game. It was, we were so engrossed in the subject of talking that actually we, we, we went off piste a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, so this is how it works. As I said, I'm going to pick a fork at random. Mm -hmm. going to suggest a different timeline that we're all living in and then I'll pose a question and as I said in the gamified version of it you would each give me an answer and I choose what's best but it's just much I, I think just as a general like conversation starter mm -hmm. it's great so first one in a timeline where Russian roulette is a family game would we exercise more or less Huh. I so, guess the first... so are we just going to kind of jump in onto the conversation and stuff like that, or yeah, 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 oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, don't feel done. like I, I, I feel the first thing that kind of probably needs to be outlined is how are we making Russian roulette a, fa a family game? Like it's grandpa's yeah. time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, from Mattel. <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah. See, I'm just kind of thinking of it. Is it a case of it's allocated to a single person or is it kind of like at a certain event like certain <laughs> pe a group of people are nominated for this happy birthday <laughs> um yeah like uh, like at every birth there's like a sort of one in one out policy <laughs> oh god oh, but that's like you... calling it a family game implies there's lots of people involved isn't that yeah yeah so 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 yeah, yeah. so in any given time anybody could can meet their end so to speak so in looking at that i think it changes uh the way in which people um view death because it it is much more of people's life in terms of it potentially could happen to them and it's a, a potentially a very immediate thing that could happen to them so for this for the sake of kind of our question to the exercise well, i think they don't exercise more because mm. you kind of have a view of you kind of have the view of i could die tomorrow so let me enjoy my life to the maximum no i'm afraid i'm afraid you've picked the wrong answer there dan and, and it's quite it's quite it's fair enough. It is binary, i assume sam you've no. got uh, sam i assume you've got the uh, the answer somewhere but um the um uh, i i think really what this is about is min maxing the way that you uh, approach every situation right so if the actual rules of russian roulette are mm -hmm. you are out <laughs> if the gun fires yes right now the 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 consequence of that is always your death, right? Mm. But well, well, not necessarily. I mean, you know, you might live a very bad life afterwards. But here's the thing: uh, that is the actual rule. The game ends when the gun fires, right? So, exercise. Hmm. What kind of exercise? I hear you say. Well, sure. Like, sure. You can't outrun a bullet, so there's no point in doing calisthenics or uh, or uh, you know any sort of like running exercise or anything like that, right? No, are there skull not. strengthening exercises? Is that Here's what you're the thing. I think there are. So, like for example, if you go and look at the way that the Tibetan monks <laughs> you can't do strengthen stuff, right? your skull to no, stop yes, a you bullet. Can, right? If you see, if you see how the Tibetan monks do all their martial arts <laughs> stuff, they have to train their hands and their stomachs and their chest muscles. They have to train their head so that they can smash blocks of ice. And I reckon if you put in enough hours in the gym, I reckon you could probably get a pretty what? sturdy head. You could nut a bullet. I reckon you could. Yeah, I think, Pete, Pete, you're revealing here that you spent very little time in a gym when you think there are certain well, exercises to strengthen your skull. I mean, but you can't really... Yeah, it's. A, I mean, I, I kind of... And that's what I love about this game is because seemingly the cards seem so disconnected from each other, but it's that human nature that we have to join the dots. Mm -hmm. And that's where the pleasure lies in this game for me, in the kind of what if... And that kind of cause and effect, the causality of this, like the butterfly effect of what is a really quite high risk game, particularly if it's played, say, of a six shooter. I like to think I would exercise more just because, as Dan was alluding to, I, 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 I kind of quite like that philosophy that, like, you know, live every day is the best you can. Um, I wouldn't be exercising constantly, um, but I would, I would probably want to. 
I probably want to kind of, I don't know, f- check in with myself, feel, you know. <laughs> okay. What, yeah, that sense of mindfulness with myself. I don't know, meditate on things before I headbutt a bullet. To be honest, to get into Pete's zen-like state that he's talking about, I'm going to need to exercise um, something to be able to do that. No, no, um, no, no, so no. Probably... There is no level of exercise that's going to make your head stop a bullet. I, I beg to disagree. Um, okay, well, I'll pepper these throughout the show. Um, and we we actually, in a surprise twist that makes us seem a lot more competent than we actually are, mm. um, we've actually got a copy of this game to give away <gasps> to what? someone who listens to this show. Um, we'll put all the details at the end because... You know, <laughs> got to keep you around. Yeah, some, yeah. Right, some way. We haven't figured out how we're going to give it away yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so we'll 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 do we'll do a few more of these. But um, we're going on. Um, uh, me and the family are going on holiday, um, and um, this is coming in the car because I think it's um, wonderful. <laughs> um, did you any of you have that? experience growing up where you there was there were kind of instances where you felt that like you were on a a different page to your parents or whoever raised you you know or you know that you felt actually there's a that you know there's there's aspects of my life things i like that they're they're just they just don't get for whatever reason what the Um, my parents don't get yeah like and to some degree vice versa i couldn't really understand why my parents were obsessed with like gardens and stuff and gardening growing up i can kind of understand it now but there was it was very clear they would obviously try and stuff but for me for me it was the um it was the sexy bit in bond films like as a kid i was like all up for all the action and i didn't understand why bond was stopping for anything i was just like who is this other person why is it why why are they getting in bond's way you don't have time bond come don't on kiss her. that's gonna be gross <laughs> yeah, get back exactly. on the, the device where you're gonna get cut in half with the laser <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, my like my folks didn't really enjoy most of the things that I was into at all. So like, there was definitely a load of stuff where it just didn't really see to, like eye to eye with them on like music and art and food, games, all the trivial pursuit films. categories is coming out. <laughs> yeah, basically, I got all the wedges. Um, but I mean, I, I think that that's. I think to some degree, that's that is in some ways natural, right? Like, there's always. There's there's always going to be at least a few things that you don't agree with with your parents. Yeah, right? no, definitely. And I think like the, I suppose the point is it's about like, and I think that's quite good because you know it's really lovely when you can kind of be the one that introduces them to something. Say for example, it's about really that mm. two way street about being open to kind of, you know, the stuff they're interested in and uh, vice versa. Really, and I'm I'm lucky enough that my parents, you know. They may not be actively interested in it, but they're interested in it because I'm interested in it, if that makes sense. Right. Like, yeah. it's not necessarily that they have to be into Matchbox yeah. cars. It's just that they're like, no. oh, you clearly see that this is, you clearly see that your kid likes this. Like, yeah. So you're you're like, yeah, great. Yeah, tell no. me all about the new, I don't know, Ford Capri Matchbox car. I don't know. I wonder if that was a popular model. I don't know. I uh, my, well, like, I think I had the Ford Capri. Matchbox did you cars. yeah it was really good i like four oh. capris they're rubbish cars they rust really badly but um they are beautiful looking things i only had a batmobile that that trumps me i i had a like a like a little like a big rucksack just full of cars and then one of those like big plastic road maps that you'd have on the floor and you just sit and you just... oh those are great oh so good but like kind of going back to the thing about the parents and things yeah, there was stuff like comic books and things like i mean my dad would introduce me to kind of music and I used to watch lots of things like Thunderbirds and like Sam was saying, Bond films and things. But, you know, you know, certain things like as you grow up, like there are certain things you discover and for whatever reason, you can kind of feel yourself kind of no longer being on the same page as you might have been really. And, you know, that can be a good thing or a bad thing potentially. And it, and, the, and the reason I'm talking about that is because um, I watched a film yesterday that just dropped on Netflix because... Uh, as Sam said, we're living in a time where you can't go out and touch things, and that goes for cinemas at the moment in the UK. Mm. Um, this is the Mitchells versus the Machines, and it, it dropped on Netflix. Um, I had a choice between watching this or Nomadland on Disney Plus. Um, I've gone for this um, just as a as a as a first kind of viewing. Um, it's a family animation film, but that's it, it's it, that's at its core, really. 
um which i i really love um it's it, it it's about a a family embracing the fact that they are not normal and it's really about this idea mm. of not being normal there's a line in the film that says don't let the world make you normal because you know this whole notion of normalcy is a bit of a misnomer normal doesn't exist and rather than trying to be this normal that doesn't exist it's about embracing those weird quirky dorky qualities that all families have like mm -hmm. uh, i've never had that situation where i've been embarrassed by my parents there've been kind of moments like oh god dad really? or mum yeah i've never really had that no <laughs> no my parents have I mean, well, look at me. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, so, they, they, it's just, yeah, they, they've just been like, oh god, Chris is doing that again. Yeah, um, it's 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 a lot. It's it's a it's by Sony Animation, okay. uh, Mike Rianda and Jeff Rowe directing it. So that Sony Animation has become now a real kind of benchmark yeah. for quality. So we've spoken about Into the Spider Verse in the past on the pod. Um, Sam introduced me years ago to Cloudy of a Chance of Meatballs. Superb. Absolutely incredible film. And there are similarities with both those films. You've got Mark Mothersbaugh does the music to this, who I absolutely adore. He did the music for Ragnarok and Cloudy of a Chance of Meatballs. And Rugrats. Yeah, he's a really talented musician, performer and comedian. He's incredible. And the animation here is very, very similar. It has those same touchstones to Into the Spider-Verse, which was groundbreaking. Mm. and this has those notes here it's brilliant that mixture of the 3d and the two-dimensional that kind mm. of intertextuality uh part kind of like youtube series part um kind of paper collage um absolutely incredible and it's um you've got this budding filmmaker katie who's about to go off to film school all she's wanted to do in the last few years is to get out and to go with what she calls her people, these people she's met online who are in this new film school she's been able to get enrolled at. And she's so super excited to go. Um, however, there's an argument with her, her father. And in order to heal things up with her, because they were previously quite close, he decides to cancel her plane tickets and for the entire family to drive cross country. Uh, almost Little Miss Sunshine-esque, really, going across country to get to university at the same time as an apocalypse begins when artificial intelligences take over the world and are imprisoning all humans. Okay, that's, that's, there's a hard turn there. Yeah, that's there's, 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 there's gone in a different direction, I would say. Yeah, but it's that classic thing where... Classic. The best thing, well, the best thing that science fiction do is where it just a bit like a, a fork in the path. It's saying a what if, and then this is the outcome. So mm. while this is happening, it's just like, well, okay, if we removed humanity and suddenly this family who see themselves on the outskirts, the mother's slightly jealous of their neighbors who are called the posers, who all do yoga together. They have these wonderful pictures on Instagram and they're all clearly posed. And, and she hasn't got one good family photo of them on holiday. And she always feels that she has to try and aspire to these people. But what would happen if everyone was taken away and humanity's survival rested on the shoulders of this family? And what follows is this really beautiful, sweet, touching, hilarious kind of caper um, that I wasn't surprised. I mean, I was originally going to talk about something else today. I watched it last night and I completely changed my mind. And I really wanted to talk about this. And I found it really, really affecting and something I really needed right now. And, and, and I'm really surprised where those sweet moments are really given the weight and length that they deserve. They're not just fleeting things. And likewise, also, it is a caper. It goes on at quite a rollicking pace. What is it that elevates it above the kind of standard, uh, kind of disposable, throwaway, we forget about it within a couple of years animations that, that tend to happen to things that aren't Pixar, that aren't, you know, um, these, these big marquee titles what is it that kind of like elevates it above that other than the kind of like touching like you know these kind of touching moments well firstly the firstly the animation is rough around the edges deliberately so there's a slightly grungy vibe to some of the animation it feels it feels like a child has done it like some of it and which is perfect because this is katie's story to some extent whereas pixar is very nice and polished and pixar pri prides itself on that polish it has of its animation it's also very much much more rooted in the now of the world, really. Um, whereas Pixar, it's almost this, there's this kind of magical realism around a lot of Pixar properties and IPs and stories. This is, you know, it, it speaks to a lot of parents now who are, you know, who have got kids, um, perhaps, who are, or likewise, we're all living in a world where we're, these technologies are ubiquitous and we're interfacing between them and that can cause a bit of a schism, um, really. 
um, you've got this kind of generational divide around technology. Mm-hmm. It, that isn't always the case. I think that sometimes we make an assumption that all children are tech savvy and likewise all people of an older generation aren't and often that isn't the case. But also it's about that almost universal thing where you've got a kid who feels they've outgrown their parents. And that hurts really looking at that, you know, whether you're the child who recognizes yourself in those moments or whether you're the parent who's who's senses that that could happen at some point. Because there's always going to be a, a little bit of a, um, a divide there. So it's one of those films, I think, that it speaks to all of us, really. Each of us is a family member there at different stages whenever we watch this film in our lives, really. And I wasn't expecting that to kind of hit, hit home as much as it did, to be honest. It's quite it's, it's quite a interesting thread that I think is is sort of being sewn through quite a lot of media at the moment. I just recently played my cat on my PS5. It was a free game in um, as part of PS Plus. And um, it was a very sort of um, a game, a bit like Superliminal, which, which Chris talked about uh, a few podcasts ago, mm. where you're just manipulating um, shapes in a space and essentially playing with... Um, you like playing in a giant babushka doll, basically, where you're you affect something that's very small, and but you're also inside that thing that you're affecting, so it becomes really big in your world. I'm not explaining it very well, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is the story was very adult, and the story that surrounded this puzzle was not oh, you've been captured or kidnapped. It wasn't you've got to solve this thing to rescue this person. It it was a very deep and affecting story about two people and their relationship and how their relationship grew and how it divided and, and how they sort of moved on afterwards. A bit a bit like Florence really, but as a yeah. puzzle game. So yeah, I'm I'm like it it's it's really great to kind of be at this point now where especially with things like animation and things like video games that are benefiting from this growth of storytelling and this general maturity and 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 depth of experience that the people involved are growing up and we're growing up with them um it's it's really nice to see on the, on that point the the kind of the ideas of kind of like in in media of like ro- the story of robots taking over the world or artificial intelligence or zombies and all that stuff these are just we've seen them churned out so many times it becomes boring so I think what's happening in the, in this case, and it reminds me of stuff like your your, your Shaun of the Dead or your uh, the kind of the the Cornetta trilogy, that kind of thing. You have these kind of big stories, but actually, it's oh, about oh. The, the people in in the middle of it and how this thing this big thing is happening around them. So obviously, in this case, you've got this kind of the apocalypse happening, but it's about this family trying to kind of move forward with their lives and how often i mean it's the same with sci-fi a lot of the time where the story kind of is a an allegory for something else that's happening it's not just oh aliens are landing and the good kill everyone that means something yeah i I think there are two other factors at play here as well i think we're 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 entering a generation now of of people consuming content that are consuming what they want to consume when they want to consume it so we obviously grew up where like what's on television tonight was a genuine question right like whereas whereas now it's simply a case of like if i if i think to myself like what do i want to what do i want to watch it's not a case of what's on it's a case of like uh, how do i feel i can go down a real rabbit hole if i really want to i can go and Watch all ten Star Trek movies. Finished all those, by the way. That odds and evens one is uh, fact is absolutely true. Um, the but like ultimately a huge part of what our our consumption of media. You know, we're, we're at this point now where we are getting to choose what it is that we actually want to watch, and because of that, we are watching the best of those things. So we expect the best, but we also expect to have our um, our expectations subverted because. We're only watching the best, whereas we used to have to watch, you know, fives, six and sevens out of tens. Now it's like if all you want to want to watch is the best movies ever made, you can just go and do that. Like that, that's that's easily done. I'd also say that there's a, a, a you know, a, a, a an addition to this, which is that obviously 
we're also at a point where most some of the mediums that we really love animation and games for example and comic books for example those are mediums that really have only matured in the last 30 years 40 years like well yeah that was the point i was making yeah like yeah like but the the maturity of that is a also comes with an additional it comes with an additional audience that is happy to engage with that work as well like it's not just simply that the creators are into all of this stuff for me it's i think it's a case of like you know we've got to the point where like i'm still playing games and it's like 30 years later right 32 33 years later and like so so the games that i want to play now i need those things to things to actually like subvert and for the story to actually be meaningful and good Mm -hmm. rather than like the story isn't just there to be the MacGuffin for the action that you want to portray anymore. It's it's now it's like now it's like no 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 we should actually treat this as a, a as a, an actual discipline within those fields. In a timeline, here we go. Where humans have necks as long as giraffes. Mm-hmm. What food would no longer exist? So we're playing um, Forks in the Timeline from Kepler Games. Uh, We're going to be giving a copy of this away at some point. Listen to the end of the show. Um, I'm suggesting a timeline in a timeline where humans have necks as long as giraffes. And the question you've got to answer is, what food would no longer exist? Uh, Spaghetti. I was thinking spaghetti, and then I was thinking, well, actually... I think because I was thinking something that maybe you use your hands for, and I thought with knife and fork with kind of spaghetti. But I think you could you'd you'd have it in your mouth and you'd suck it up, and it would you could you could do that. I was thinking maybe something along the lines of like a sandwich or something that you have to use your hands for. Um, well, the sandwich was invented, of course, as we all know, as a food to be eaten with um, one hand, whilst the other hand could be busy doing something else. Playing cards, wasn't it? You're playing cards. But it was designed to be eaten with your like that hand to mouth action. But this would be mouth to hand, surely. So the sandwich would still be relevant. I mean, I mean, we've got it. I mean, the, I mean, the elephant in the room is how flexible is this neck? Hang on, hang on. There's an elephant in the room. Yeah, but um, so hang on. I think, I think we're just going to be socialists. We'll feed each other. That's fair enough. Bit. Yeah, maybe. No, Pete doesn't like the idea of that at all. I could see. Look at his face. The idea of somebody. I bet you, even when you were a baby in a high chair, you wouldn't let anyone feed you. <laughs> I will you. be feeding myself from now on. What Potter. are you doing? <laughs> um, Mother, give me the airplane. I shall make sure it lands correctly. Um, our soup. Soup, because like it's really difficult to bring it up on the spoon that far. It gets cold by the time. I mean, it gets that, right, exactly. not, like, that's a good shape. That's a good shape. That that, that is, fits that in with the, the concepts <laughs> I was looking at. Lollipop, because to hold it like an ice cream, like to hold it on a cone. How You're that... absolutely right. Yeah, a lollipop or any sort of food on a stick, basically. Well, no, surely then in this reality they'd just hang those items high up. Oh, like like off telegraph seems, wires. Seems like a lot of work. See, I can't yeah, think this of is any the reality of the food we type that has yeah. balance involved, like a soup, like soup does, like balance as you lift the spoon. What a silhouette! <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, what a game! One of my favourite videos featuring Stan Lee. Go on is where he is um, bemoaning the fact of 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 fanboys quote unquote having the discussion of who would win out of like mm-hmm. so and so fight and in this video he goes on to explain that well, the writer decides like and he's just like has he has no patience for these kind of arguments you can tell he's a man who like for 60 years has been asked questions along the lines of who would win out of a fight between reed richards and um yeah wolverine and like there's this wonderful video of him where basically he just says it doesn't matter the writer decides if he wants reed richards to win then then he's gonna win if he wants you know if the vision's gonna win the vision's gonna win like it's these arguments do not mean anything 
they are completely null and void. In that vein, <laughs> what two fictional... <laughs> I'm posing you the question based on a, a game that I've been playing. What two fictional characters would you like to see fight in in a in a game? I would go for Miss Havisham. <laughs> okay. And Winnie the Pooh. Okay, so what's Miss Havisham bringing to the? If she was going to have like a set of mechanics. Yep. No, I've got you on this one. Um, so wait, wait, so. Miss Havisham, she would outlive the other player, so she would have a prolonged lifespan. So Ooh. she would be like, she would she would rely on being able to chip away the other player at the other player. So she's been there for a long time, so she's got patience. So she probably, I imagine, she wouldn't move much because that's the whole nature. When you encounter her, she's she's basically in her home, and it's it's, it's got cobwebs and everything over it. She's still in her wedding dress. So she, but she is, she has got a long lifespan. Mm. So I like that. that. What about what about the poo? What about the poo? Oh bother! Just very sticky, isn't he? Just very, very clumsy. So I can imagine that actually, inadvertently, because he he tends to get into situations where through clumsiness he manages to dodge lots of mm. risks. So I can imagine actually that would play to Pooh's advantage. That a, a character may attack him, but he would he would have somehow accidentally managed to avoid that blow so i can um, kind yeah. of like a drunken master kind of thing mm. yes that's it yeah, exactly like yeah that. he, yeah definitely so i think that'd be quite an interesting match because it'll be ascertaining who lasts longer will it be miss havisham because of her prolonged lifespan or winnie the pooh relying not on his luck but on his, on his um, inability to uh kind of walk properly well well, well, Chris. Well, I'll give Dan and Chris, Dan and Pete, a bit more time to think about this, and 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 I'll and I'll start now writing the email to Yellow to see if they can get Miss Havisham and Winnie the Pooh in the next series of Unmatched, because this is what um, uh, I've been playing recently. And um, Pete, I'm going to say um, some words to you now, which I think I'm going to cause you to sit upright into into the seat. So, Unmatched is described as a miniatures. Uh dueling okay game no, okay well, yep all right yeah like those two. <laughs> um, kind of in, it kind of implied but sort of, sort of <laughs> yeah. yeah um and um this comes from yellow uh restoration games and mondo games and it's by rob davio who you may remember from such games as pandemic legacy and also Justin D. Uh, Jacobson. And essentially what Unmatched is, it's a bit like that question I poised you. It's a bit like, what if you had um, Bruce Lee versus Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Hmm. And it's a two or four player game. There is a three player variant, but I don't... And even the four player is a little bit clunky. I feel like this is at its best when it's a pure, like, as it says, like miniatures dueling game. Mm-hmm. And so far, the Unmatched has spawned a whole like series of different expansions and, and they've worked with lots of different IPs to essentially create this world where these fictional characters are all fighting up against each other. Uh, we very fortunately got sent the... Um, Battle of Legends Volume 1, which included uh, Sinbad the Sailor, King Arthur, uh, Medusa, and Alice from Alice in Wonderland. Mm. And um, inside this box, you get um, a little miniature representing each character. And then they each have a, a, a deck of cards that represent how they fight, how they interact, um, how they move around the board, and all those kind of things, and the mechanics that, that control them. And you have this wonderful experience where when I first showed this to Chris, you know, I put the box in front of him and said, well, who do you want to fight us? Pick a, pick a fighter. And, and, and Chris picked his fighter. He, I think you picked King Arthur, didn't That's you? That's correct. King Arthur and Merlin. And then um, I sort of, he sort of slid the box back to me and I said, all right, and now I'll pick my fighter and you like peruse it like a fine cheese board. Yeah. Sinbad the sailor. Um, and the game really itself is is reasonably quite quite simple you have this board in front of you which has um these circles on it which mark out um where your character can be positioned 
you play cards on your turn and those cards can influence how you move, how you attack, a certain sort of like abilities or act special actions that your character can do and you just and you just fight it out, you duel between these two characters. I think where this game really struck me is how it made me feel like I was playing Magic the Gathering again. And that those are words I don't take lightly with this game because the reason why I've always loved Magic the Gathering is for the stories that it tells and for the ability that it gives players to go, here is a world, here is a, a whole raft of different mechanics and characters and you can do what you want. You build decks to play how you want to play. So, for example, one of my favourite things I did with my with Magic the Gathering is I created a deck of dinosaurs and pirates because I thought those would be fun to fight other people with. Unmatched does a very similar thing, in my opinion, and it is remarkable and um, wonderful for that respect in that you get given a character and each of the characters feels so exceptionally unique to play with that... The game is not necessarily beating your opponent. It is that, but it's also finding out about your character and learning how they play and exploring how their deck works and how they interact with the other player, which is what I've always loved so much about Magic the Gathering. Like, Dan, like I feel like Unmatched would be a game that I'd much prefer to introduce you to than Magic the Gathering, but I feel like you'll be getting very, very similar things out of both experiences, but one's just a little bit more, I kind of want to say pop culturally appropriate. Just more accessible, I think. Than the other. But a bit more accessible. Like, for example, like in Unmatched, you can get Little Red Riding Hood, Beowulf, Bruce Lee, Buffy, uh, Bigfoot. There's even a Jurassic Park edition where you can fight InGen versus the Raptors. That's meant to be exceedingly good fun. And this has been a game where after I've played it, I've had that feeling, which I do after ev- whenever I play Magic the Gathering, I, I always finish it and I go, I want to buy more. Mm. I want to experience more of what yeah. this game this game can do. I want to experience more of these mechanics and I want to learn a bit more about how they play. After I finish playing Unmatched, I want to play more. I want to play with that character. I want to see how that deck works. I just, I just love it. I really like, you know, I'm I'm really desperate to kind of, you know, I kind of feel like I want to get more. Mm. Um, just so like the next time I'm with you guys, it's like, right, choose your fighter. We're going to like have a have a duel. So here's here's a question for you then. Like mm. one of the what I think one of the core issues with something like Magic the Gathering is that like uh, it's a high barrier to entry in a lot of different ways. But the big one is it. it <laughs> With with some high barrier to entry games, let's say for example miniatures war games, you can inter- you can have let's say you're some sort of dork like me, you can buy two different squads and paint them all up, and you can get ep- absolutely everything ready. You can build an army list, you can do absolutely every everything, and then you can invite somebody over and say, right, I'm going to teach you how this game plays, and it's absolutely fine. With something with magic, something like Magic the Gathering. There's so much in every stage of the process, like building a deck, knowing what everything needs to, like how everything works, knowing how like certain phases of of magic works. That actually getting somebody else into the game is really challenging. I mean, you see wizards do this loads of yeah. you know Friday Night Magic and tutorials in Magic Arena and stuff like that, trying to get people into the game. But it's difficult to basically, it's difficult. Uh, to rather than say like take a board game that you own and take it to somebody's house and go I'm going to teach you how to play Arkham Horror you can't really do that with magic so my question is like does it have that same drawback or can you easily introduce somebody who might not be that au fait with these kinds of games there's no deck building per se you you just each character has a deck you just huh. pick a character you get given a deck and that's it you fight and I, and I think Dan what would appeal to you is what appealed to me was the fact that rather than having, say, a la magic, it, there's this imaginary line between you and the other player and you're playing cards directly in front of each other. What you have here is an actual board that your figures move around on. Mm-hmm. So 
for me personally, I know it sounds very silly, but being able to visualize it as a kind of a spatial puzzle in that way, not only did was it I found it easy to kind of pop problem solve, but likewise it felt more real. I could kind of visualize mm-hmm. and narrativize it, that sort of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's all very well and good. But what's the plastic like? That's the thing that everybody cares about. What are the minis like? Really good. Yeah. Yeah. They are really, really good. And they've got, I don't know what you call them. There's probably a, a technical name for them. They've got these nice colored plastic bases that they okay. slot into. Like they know that these miniatures are going to be handled and, you know, manipulated. And there's yeah. a lot of movement that goes on. So, so they are robust. So, P and Dan, what are your two fictional characters? Okay, so my, my, my matchup is Moby Dick. And the shark from Jaws. Interesting. Wow. Very good. How would how would they fight? Uh, well, it, it's kind of like yes, like the shark is faster. He's got more speed, um, but his 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 attacks aren't as powerful as Moby Dick's. But Moby Dick has a, a, is slower, so you kind of it's it's that kind of risk and reward. You can kind of risk and go for a, for a big shot with the shark. But if you get caught out, then you, Moby Dick's going to do some damage for you. So it's, it's your typical kind of, to use kind of video game kind of views, it's kind of the 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 rogue versus the tank kind of kind of characters. The guy who can move quickly, do little bits of damage, or the guy who moves slowly but can really mess you up. I mean, and already, Dan, I'm thinking about pitting Miss Havisham against the shark from Jaws. <laughs> Mm. Pete, it's all on you. Pete. Bring us home. I think I'd choose Sherlock Holmes and uh and also uh Witterquick from the Visionaries. Witterquick. Mm. Witterquick. I think Pete kind of just thought of Sherlock Holmes and thought that's far too mainstream. In order to balance yes. this out, I've got to go really, really heavily into the obscure just to balance it out. So, what would what would Whitaquick look like in terms of its abilities on the board to make it distinct? And 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 also Sherlock is already one in a in the unmatched Cobble and Fog. There's the Invisible Man, Sherlock, Dracula, and Jekyll and Hyde. So, oh, that sounds like a that sounds like a brilliant set. Yeah. Oh, oh, my, okay, all right. Something on the uh, the old wish list. Um, we're basically Sherlock Holmes. We all know what Sherlock Holmes plays like. Uh, Witter Quick. He's basically super fast. He can run basically close to light speed. Um, and so he's kind of like think of him kind of like a little bit like the Flash, uh, except for he's got a panther hologram on his chest, uh, which he can basically transform into a panther. Um, so it would be like really, really fast and then like mauling. <laughs> so so why why would you put Sherlock Holmes up against him? How how's Sherlock gonna fight that? Um I think he would have to uh well well if anyone's gonna figure it out, Dan, it'd be Sherlock, wouldn't it? Right. Last one. Final fork off. In a timeline where Santa Claus is real and omnipresent. Uh. What is the ultimate status symbol? So in a timeline where Santa Claus is real and omnipresent, uh, what is the ultimate status symbol? So I'm assuming by this that Christmas is still... is is real. Still. Yeah, I'm imagining he still only works one day a year. So you, So, but what this does, Dan, is it frees up a lot of the economy... That don't have to, so parents don't have to spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds on their children. Santa Claus is doing it all. It's true. Um, But also, a thing that parents don't have to do is rat in their children, right? Because if they're omnipresent, then they are everywhere at the same time, right? Which means that you don't you don't now have that threat from parents saying, "Well, if you don't eat your greens, then I'll be telling Santa that." that you've been bad this year and he'll leave you coal or whatever, right? Yeah, you don't but, have likewise, that but likewise, they're also being policed because they won't get anything for Christmas, yeah, the, will they? Yeah, it, it well, means the naughty and nice list is a real thing. Yeah. It's a re- yeah. And, and, it, and it's a binary as well. It's yeah. like the gladiator. Right, okay. Also, like, they could ask for uh, okay. whatever they wanted from Santa, can't they? 
and they can ask for whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean you get it, though. So what are status symbols now, then? So what in our timeline, where, unfortunately, you know, don't want to say it, but... Um, what are the, the status symbols now? So Big House, probably? Gone. Gone. Nice because, car. No, gone, because Santa is real and omnipresent. If, and, and, and if that's the case, Santa can get you whatever you want, right? He that's can, the rule. but doesn't yeah. definitely... Absolutely, but it suddenly becomes less of a status symbol because we're not saying the economy's gone away. What we're saying is that if you want something and you are good, which, you know, I would say, depending on how strict Santa is on this nonsense, like, I would say that it's going to be fairly easy to get hold of things that would traditionally be status symbols. So if you've been good all year and you finally get round to the 24th and you send, you write your little letter and you fire up the chimney or whatever it is, um, and you say, I want a giant house... And you've been good. Well, suddenly you've got it. So that's gone away. I, I, I know what it is. I think the best the best data symbol you can get is is having Santa attend your event. He's a busy man. He's making all those toys. No, he's not because he's omnipresent. Sam, he's yeah, on no, but, but, but have, he, you, have you not seen Arthur Christmas? He is oh, attending. Such a good film. But he is attending. He's with the Times. He is attending your event because he's omnipresent. Um, I reckon, like. L- being a bit cynical because anything generally that's omnipresent there is a little whiff of uh dictatorship and a little whiff <laughs> of something fascistic <laughs> whoa 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 <laughs> what we are not equating <laughs> father christmas with, with the fascism. third reich <laughs> with the third oh, well, reich. No, no, no. i don't well, think it's ever been done so, chris what so the fact that somebody's constantly surveying you chris it's it's Santa. He's real and he's everywhere. It doesn't mean that he's suddenly going to invade, like, uh, like I don't know, France. Like, oh no, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the fact that actually you've got one person who has authority over uh, what we do but he, uh, and but how we he behave. Doesn't, but he doesn't, he doesn't have he doesn't. ultimate authority. If you you could just turn around to him and say, "Do you know what, Santa? I don't care that you give me coal. I, I don't. I don't need a big fancy pants house. I haven't been that good. You know what? Fair enough. Give me the coal. I don't care. Yeah. Give me. You whatever. remember the resistance? Yeah. That. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> not resisting. You just saying I don't want a present. You just. Yeah. You could just say I just right. don't want to take part in this, Santa. I'm sorry. All right. I'm, I may. Have, I may have overstretched it a little bit. I do apologize. I think you might have. I think you might have. D- Dan, please edit that sensitively. <laughs> and that was uh staying in part another episode in the can as the professionals say uh i'm dan frost uh hi long time no speak um yeah hope you enjoyed the show uh with me uh sam was there sam turner uh peter willington and chris darby made it the four of us um episode 127 wow that's a lot um yeah, a uh, huge thank you to Kepler Games who provided us with a copy of their fantastic game, Forks in the Timeline. We had a lot of fun with that and I think we will continue to have a lot of fun with that. And if you would like to have some fun with it, uh, you can head over to our Instagram page. Uh, coming up, we'll have some information about how you can win a copy. We don't do competitions very often, so it's always an exciting time when that happens. So yeah, head over to there, keep an eye on it. And whilst you're there, you can see what we get up to. So we we uh, post on there things that we're doing, games that we're playing. Sam does some. Sam and Chris have done some lovely unboxing videos. So if you're interested in those, you can take a look at some of the stuff that they've been playing. Uh, you can also head over to our Twitter account. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Pretty much everywhere you need us to be we are there if there's a social media where we're not let us know and we'll get pete on the case um everywhere you go we're pretty much all at staying in pod including our email so if you want to contact us on that that's staying in pod at gmail.com um and i think that's everything i think i've covered all the bases I've, I've got a checklist of things i need to say in this this outro um and no one's really here to to guard me so i can say whatever i want it's it's a dangerous and quite a powerful place to be um but that's all i have to say so It's been lovely spending this time with you. Uh, I'll see you soon. Take care. Goodbye.